Uh, we have all the rapporteurs in place, so if you please could have a seat, Stan. Yes. It's a fantastic sign to see you so engaged, discussing, and that's exactly what the stakeholder is about, the stakeholder forum, because it's your event. So could we please ask you to sit down? And then we're going to start the final wrap-up session. And uh, this final session is going to be led by Anders Olauson who is the president of the European Patients Forum. Uh, so he will also um, invite the rapporteurs from the three parallel sessions. Um, and then Anders will do the close up. And I don't know if you've noticed in the program that we are starting the meeting with the patient and we are finishing also with the voice of the patients. And both of them are Anders. So we need to reflect for next year um, if we take people starting at B next year, or what we're going to do. Anders. Yeah, but the first one was from Denmark, so it's a li little different. Hello, everybody. Now you're coming to the final point, which all of you have been waiting for today, aren't you? So we're going to try to give a report back from what happened during the three parallel sessions so we don't miss anything. And then I've been um, giving the honor to uh, say something in the end which you haven't thought of today. So it will be either a short one or a long one. But we, uh -huh, okay. Please let that hang on till uh, after the rapporteurs. Okay, Kim, a Nordic person. So I'm going to try to uh, report back from the uh, session on advanced therapies, uh, advanced therapies in medicinal, uh, medicinal products. And uh, it was uh, an interesting session. Uh, it was moderated by Arndt Hövler, who's head of unit uh, from the uh, EU Commission, so uh, DG Research and Innovation, Novel Medical Development. Uh, and then we had four panelists, uh, Tim Alsop from New Centis, Regenerative Medicine, Pfizer. Uh, who's also uh, familiar with IMI as he's coordinating a, a project there. Then we had uh, Lucia Faccio, I hope I pronounced this correctly, head of business uh, at the Fondazione Teleton, uh, which is a charity that has uh, funded, uh, uh, or that funds uh, research in, um, in this field uh, and uh, has recently hooked up with uh, GSK. Uh, regarding a treatment there. Uh, Samantha Parker from um, uh, uh, an SME, Lysogen, also active in, uh, in the field of uh, rare disease and uh, also an active member of uh, or active in uh, the ERDERC, the International Rare Disease Consortium, um, where a lot of this uh, research on advanced therapies is coming from. Uh, and then finally, uh, Rocio Sal Salvadore, Rolden, uh, policy officer uh, from the Director General of Health and Food Safety, the European Commission, so uh, regulatory affairs specialist. Um, the session started by a brief presentation by Tim Elsep to try and set the scene. He defined the notion of advanced therapy medicinal products, so ATMPs. Um, so what is it? It's uh, gene therapy, it's somatic cell therapy, it's tissue engineering products, and then also combined ATMPs. Uh, and then he moved on to, um, to identify a number of challenges that, uh, uh, that ATMPs uh, and the development of ATMP, the success of ATMP uh, depends on. Uh, and. Uh, the first of these uh, challenges, there are four of them, uh, is really about uh, identifying the treatment stage. So this is about patient stratification. Um, the second is about the manufacturing processes. So uh, GMP, this is about uh, how uh, it is necessary to move to automization. Automization, yes. Uh, and uh, the third one, analytics. So that's uh, how you can link product attributes to therapeutic effect uh, throughout the life cycle. So this is uh, really about 
uh, efficacy and uh, being able to show that you can uh, safely reproduce uh, your results and monitor them uh, in, in a constant way. Uh, and then finally, and this is probably the biggest <laughs> challenge identified, uh, was the healthcare system uptake, where uh, uh, there is a lack of uh, large, robust, uh, randomized clinical trials that can guide the decision of policy making. So this, these were th three or sorry, four uh, <coughs> challenges where uh, Tim felt that maybe the manufacturing of ATM pieces uh, where we've come the furthest. Um, we had uh, the question, so the, the question that was uh, trying to be, that we were trying to answer in this session was, is it time for IMI to move into uh, advanced therapy medicinal products? And uh, I must say that my conclusion is that uh, after having heard the, uh, the, the panelists and uh, uh, the audience there, that it is time, and for a number of reasons. Now, there are also a number of concerns, but there are also sort of the reasons why uh, IMI uh, should consider moving in, or should move in to, to this uh, area. Uh, one of the concerns raised was, of course, uh, the, uh, the well, HTA issues, the cost benefit, uh, uh, reimbursement, uh, of, uh, for such uh, uh, products, uh, and, um, and uh, uh, I, I think ultimately is, is, this, is this going to be uh, sustainable, um, was a question from the audience, and uh, I think a response was that uh, it's, um, there is no guarantees, it's a journey we must make together, uh, uh, but also that um, it's really a question, it, it's something that will be decided on a case, uh, a case by case uh, basis, a, a bit like many other uh, uh, products. And, um, and so that uh, it, it's important, and this is a lesson then, uh, something that we can take back for the IMI, that the HTA bodies are uh, integrated into the projects. Am I doing fine in time or am I still? You're doing great. I'm doing great. Yeah. You're solving all the problems. Perfect. You get one more minute to solve two problems less. Okay. Uh, the other important point that was made was it's important uh, to uh, open up to other sectors. Now, IMI2 is open up uh, to other industries, but clearly in this, uh, in this uh, area, technology is a driver. And finally, scaling up uh, was also uh, something that uh, uh, was very seen as very important. Now, um, uh, here it is. Fine. I think, I think what I take back my conclusion is uh, uh, that uh, this is a field in which uh, SMEs have been very important, in which academia has been a, a driver, and also charities. And it's time for industry to step up to the plate, and I think industry is probably also willing to step up to the plate because there are very promising results. So that's one important thing. Then, uh, as it was put by one of the uh, speakers, uh, it's also time for Europe to put a flag in the sand uh, in this area, and, uh, and uh, I, IMI can uh, help set an example and push forward this ecosystem, the necessary e ecosystem, by the collaborative approach that it is taking, uh, and uh, it's uh, also an inclusive approach that uh, IMI 2 is sort of all about. Okay. Thanks. Do you have an idea of uh, how that flag will consist of, beside the two billion? Well, beside the two billion, I think uh, the idea was more of uh, setting examples or, uh, you know, uh, projects that have this programmatic uh, approach uh, that are inclusive, that uh, span from, say, basic research, but all the way to the market. I think that okay. was, uh, that Excellent. was my answer. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, moving on to, um, to Magda, yes? I just was looking for what your first name, Stavros Malas, but you turned into Magda instead. Right. Um, That's a huge responsibility. Stavros actually gave me the, uh, the, the responsibility of reporting back from the session. And I'd like to say um, very interesting discussion and uh, the topic 
which was about uh, a completely new um, program that we are trying to, um, to set up in IMI and which we've just opened consultation about, um, gathered three panelists uh, that represent actually the three uh, essential questions around uh, what we are trying to do in this program, DG Santé, because after all this is about healthcare and impact uh, on, on the sustainability of healthcare systems as well as business sustainability, DG Connect, because it is about exploiting the potential of big data in healthcare, and many talk about it, but there is time to do something about it, and NICE, because this is about exploiting this data in, uh, in the healthcare uh, decision making in healthcare systems as well as in the research practice. So what are we talking about? We are talking about a new uh, potential program uh, that we hope to launch in September and which would put additional focus on uh, big data real world evidence beyond uh, research uh, practice and safety, a new focus on outcomes. Why? Uh, because by doing so and by combining the three and goals we would be able to um, address the issues of healthcare system sustainability as well as research productivity. We would be able to do that uh, by exploiting and leverage the potential of big data, which is not just real world evidence, but the data in the healthcare systems as well, and by addressing some of the questions related to how to access this information, how to make it interoperable, how to actually be able to um, do something with the big data potential potential that today is untapped. Um, the key questions from the discussion and the key suggestions, because it is a consultation, uh, were around whether the project is relevant, and I think we didn't ask this question so straightforwardly, but I didn't hear from anyone that the project wasn't relevant. I heard from the panelists that it was, and that indeed it would contribute to changing uh, the business models and the healthcare models of the future. I think this is important. We heard a lot about the data sources, the data quality, uh, the access to information, trust, and, uh, and personal data protection issues, all of that has to be addressed and would be addressed in the context of the projects. We heard an issue, um, a question about patient involvement and is this project patient-centric or not, because this doesn't seem to come across so clearly in the communication around it, and yes, the project is patient-centric, but indeed we need to change slightly our communication. What is missing, it seems so, from the discussion, on the one hand, is uh, skills and experience that is necessary in order to be able to exploit that. I'm taking note of this and report back to the projects. We had a discussion on whether Alzheimer's disease or dementias are the right therapeutic career for doing that. It was the feeling that maybe there are therapeutic careers where the disease is better defined, where, we, where there are data that could be exploited. I think that um, we may benefit from taking different types of therapeutic careers which are different um, a time of um, a progress in terms of both outcome definition, disease definition, and data availability because we would be also able to learn from that, but again, this is a question that I would report back to our colleagues who developed the projects. Data in healthcare systems and structured um, access to the data and organization of data in order to be able to exploit that was also a question that was addressed. So if I may summarize, we go into um, new models, um, new models which uh, um, might actually be facilitated by um, access to different types of information, exploitation of different types of information. Um, projects where healthcare uh, decision makers, healthcare systems, patients and regulators can um, contribute to and benefit from being there and also defining together both what outcomes are and how to measure them and how to collect information. So relevance, yes, therapeutic careers um, to be looked at again and uh, additional questions to be addressed, but all in all I think we are on the right track and there is quite a lot of excitement about it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to the third session, optimizing IMI's funding scheme. Elmar, please. Sure. Thanks. Good afternoon. So um, I'm happy to report back from the session that we had upstairs, chaired by Marta Gomez, the chair of the state's representative group, and we had on the panel. 
three colleagues from IMI, uh, Magda Gunn, Magali Poineau, and Catherine Brett. And we had uh, uh, Professor Kiwi Pelto from uh, the Karolinska Institute uh, introducing her experience from participation in a large Alzheimer's disease project. So we had a very good discussion, but before we got to that, we had a brief introduction where we first had Magali explain us the IMI participation rules uh, and uh, funding rules and IPR rules, gave a very nice uh, quick overview, uh, highlighting the flexibility, for example, on IPR. Uh, Magda Gunn explained uh, the process from call definition uh, to project uh, evaluation and then also gave uh, some very practical and useful tips, I think, on how to apply to IMI uh, calls for proposals. Uh, Catherine uh, made a nice um, summary of the different opportunities for becoming involved in IMI, where of course one opportunity is to become a participant in a project, either as a participant or as a coordinator, but of course there are other opportunities such as becoming a member of the IMI joint undertaking, which would take a few years. It's a somewhat complicated process, but still uh, it's an opportunity. There are of course much quicker and more flexible becoming an associated partner, such as JDRF, as we heard earlier today. She emphasized the role patient, patient organizations can play in IMI projects, which can, for example, be uh, as uh, partners of advisory bodies, or so, so you don't really have to be a full partner. Um, and then from the, uh, from Professor Kivi Pelto, she uh, explained a bit about her project, which is really a quite large uh, Alzheimer's disease project aiming at prevention of the disease. So she explained uh, the setup uh, with the clinical trial where you have one common um, um, placebo cohort and the others are kind of ready to uh, test different interventions. Uh, but then really already leading up to the discussion, she explained also that, um, you know, on how can we optimize and some practical tips on how we can make better uh, some how projects are run. And in this already large project, there is actually the opportunity uh, to involve new centers. And I think that is, uh, can be retained also for future, that uh, in some cases, especially in these clinical projects, uh, where you do need a certain number of clinical trial centers for recruiting patients and so on, um, that it may be an option to have a core set of partners who would originally form the consortium, but then you, uh, these, these uh, cis, uh, uh, projects are then open to join other partners. Um, in the discussions, a number of uh, questions were raised, really ranging from some p particular interests and uh, concerns of industry participants, so from FPS side, but also more widely. Um, and I'd like to start with the point about in involving other industries, because that really came from different uh, interventions, um, where um, it was emphasized that clearly IMI needs, uh, for example, big data, needs smart data companies, and so on. Uh, and it was clarified that, of course, that is fully possible, um, either, of course, as project participants, and then depending on the size, you are either eligible for funding or you are not. But, of course, uh, as the associated partners, industries can join, and uh, as my, uh, FPI had explained earlier today, there's also the possibility of joining, uh, teaming up with FPI themselves. Um, but really, this was a theme that came several times, and um, so we have size already involved uh, in in the program. Um, also, we have, of course, had uh, discussions with industries for becoming, let's say, associated partners from the beginning of the program. That has so far not led to, or we didn't, I mean, at the beginning of the program, we didn't have a big industry as an associated partner, but clearly these discussions are ongoing. Um, there were a number of questions on, uh, from industry side on how the um, in-kind contribution, um, you know, we have actually, as you may know, a so-called cap of 30% from uh, uh, where the in-kind contribution can come from, that a maximum of 30% can come from outside of Europe. Um, it was and is a discussion emphasized that, of course, this is a program where we want to have research in Europe and it's uh, also meant to be an incentive for industrial research to take place in Europe. Um, and um, so that was, um, and there were some other questions, somewhat more technical, that I don't think I need to report here back. Um, another big point in the discussion and the questions was the scale of the projects, how can we make this more or better or uh, easier for partners to join. 
Um, we had already, I've, I have already pointed out this uh, uh, example from the more clinically oriented projects, but um, from the SME side, Claire uh, Scantleberry pointed out that maybe one could um, have kind of smaller uh, topics uh, where you then would join a different type of consortia um, because sometimes for SMEs it's really not so easy to uh, get involved uh, from the beginning in this very large consortia that it kind of uh, is a disincentive for certainly small companies to join. Um, okay. We had one more thing I wanted to mention, yeah, which was really uh, as for call processes. Um, we have, of course, a preferred call process in IMI, which is a two-stage process that uh, most people here will know quite well. Of course, uh, we have done the Ebola call process last <coughs> autumn and in December very quickly, quickly as a single stage process. So the question was, well, have we learned any lessons from that? And what are really, what can we take back uh, in practical uh, for moving forward? Because obviously the speed was impressive, I think, uh, from first ideas at the end of October to closing the call and having evaluations finished before Christmas yeah. is obviously quite a record, I think. Uh, not just for IMI, but for uh, many other uh, schemes of that sort. And um, so in the discussion, it was clear that obviously one cannot just uh, take this as a model for the future as is. There are quite a few concerns that were raised um, because with the speed came, of course, challenge of joining consortia. Um, and then as perhaps as lesson learned, I mean, a formal document is currently being prepared and I'm, I think we are all looking forward to that. Um, but it was, uh, and, and Marta emphasized that, uh, that really we need to look at our processes, just our standard processes, to have those run as efficiently and as quickly as possible. Uh, and then, of course, uh, it was uh, emphasized that in IMI2 now we do have actually, we use a range of different call processes uh, from smaller projects to larger projects, and that's probably quite useful. Um, that we use them as appropriate and that we don't go for one size fits all. And I think I have captured most of the discussion okay. uh, from that. Thanks. Thank you. Now we'll see the slides. Please. Okay. Everyone has heard the speakers today, so I will not try to repeat them or rank them how good or valuable they have been today. So I will try to give you a patient view of what has been said today or taken place today. Pre, oh see, it's green to push up. Pre IMI, there was nothing. It was darkness. All the world was scattered. <laughs> they were scattered and said and divided in researchers. Pharma industry, patient organization, government, politician, member states, and so on and so on. But they were all in silos. Then IMI came. Everyone understood that they need to work together more, and we get the stakeholders that normally know each other already. Then IMI too came, or is coming. Lesson learned that cooperation is not that easy, and more stakeholders need to be invited to the table. Now the challenge word and the call word was health is all in all part of life. So holistic view is the target. I'm on my fifth or in my fifth, I don't know the proper English word for it, but I'm on my fifth commissioner. <laughs> I've been in here a long time and it's the time, this is the first time they talk and I hear a commissioner say that we have to identify all aspects of a disease. We have to bring all these aspects and actors together and we have to make them start working. This is the first time. So what's happening now in IMI 1 and 2 is obviously something that goes on in the whole European Commission. I have enjoyed very much listening to all of you today. It has really been a great day. And I will now try to give you what I have heard. I have heard that we, blank, that we realize that all stakeholders need to work together from the beginning. 
We also realized to invite more stakeholders than traditionally, like MedTech and ICT and others. We realized that we need to create a common communication and understanding between all stakeholders. In other words, we face a gigantic change of culture. A gigantic change of culture. What is it? Yeah, aha, uh -huh, uh -huh, it was a quick one. The importance, you heard that above there. The importance of patient involvement in medicines R&D. We have it in the rational EU party, we've seen in that. And we also see it in the new project, project called Patient Smart, which is creating a platform for meaningful involvement. And there also is a now a specific section on the IMI website with guidance on patient's involvement. Patient involvement is becoming more systematic in IMI, which is great. I heard also that I believe it is very important to get the governance right in IMI project as well. And leadership, we need a special leadership, we need a special skills for that. IMI public-private partnership are rightly under constant scrutiny and it's very important we can demonstrate the highest level of integrity, ethics and transparency and assume good intent. I heard the difference between the first IMI and IMI 2 is that the emphasis on societal impact. From a patient perspective, this is absolutely critical as many of our challenges are linked to the society we aspire to with fairness, and equity at the heart of this. Another difference is the opportunity to involve other industries, medical technology and ICT. This is an extremely welcome development reflecting the need for an integrated collaborative approach and warmly welcomed by the patient community. The importance of information on AMI reach, reaching national level and all member states it's absolutely important. Do we have a strategy on what to ensure meaningful involvement of stakeholders at the national level? I question myself after today. We have it on the global dimension. The global impact of IMI is now being seen and felt and the achievement of the fast track Ebola initiative is a prime example. So, take home message. Big data. When you hear, you must understand that I love e-health. But when you hear big data and all the glory around it, I miss the seriousness because it's not enough. It is, it, you can, might understand when you listen to it that if we gather all the data, then we will have the solution to all problems. And then we will put the solution on the table for those who decide and then they will change. Not going to happen because I have very big difficulties to change my life. I need very, very good argument, not from outside, but from inside. Understanding doctors are the same. You know, I believe that, but that's true. Politicians are the same. Government are the same. Everyone is the, is the same. I know this because I put 10 years ago a paper proving that health economic Sweden could save two billion Swedish crown, that is not two billion euro, but a lot of money by changing the way they work with patients and families with rare diseases. And the minister said, yes, very good, very interesting. Good, I said, now we do it. No, next question. Are you crazy? Yes, we move on. But don't you see, don't you understand what I'm saying? Yes, I understand what you're saying, moving on. So I went... I become furious and then she slammed the hand on the floor on the, on the table and said Anders I am the minister I decide yeah obviously I said and left because the problem is that they can't just take it in and make use of it because making use of the big data I love big data patient organization is not standing in between using the big data or gathering it we can find solutions for integrity and privacy and things like that. I'm not worried about that. But when we have these tools, then the big change and the big work starts. 
And that has to be involved. And I, that is what I really send with you. We need to work on this much more if we're going to see it happen. We also need to find, be more proactive in finding actors who work in a cross-silo manner and are now new to the field, broadening our gene bank. The people are in the room, I saw you 10 years ago. Some of you has get older and some of you has get younger. Some of you get beard, looking younger. But there are no newcomers. There are not new people. Yeah, there are some uh, med tech and ICT, but yeah, yeah. But there are not newcomers. We need to be proactive to find them. We can't just sit as a committee. I'm looking to the commission now. You can't just sitting there and say, here it is, two billion euro, come and find it. That will not happen. We need to go out and be proactive on member state level because they are all out there and they have to be used. We need to be more generous in sharing experience than to dare to be transparent. Industry is becoming, I mean farm industry, is becoming more and more transparent, but it's pushing the big elephant ahead. They are not driving it and they are not walking freely, but they are doing it. And we need to do that more and more and more. And parallel to that, we need new legislation and look into that. Trust among stakeholders. For instance, trust patient. We heard that bias patient. Oh, no, no. How can we abandon them? Bias researcher. No, they were not talking about because they could be biased, and that's okay, but bias patient. We need to create trust, and for that we need to meet. That I appreciate very much, this kind of conferences. Maybe the most important thing is not what has been said from up here, me included, but most important what we have said to each other when we have walked around. We need to create trust, and that is extremely more important. And learn from other actors. I heard it somewhere, someone said we need to bring in others. Maybe the car industry, maybe the finance. Someone who has been moving ahead of Taylor. You know Taylor who invented the, um, the, the word before lean production and benchmarking and things like that? Taylor is the one that dominates the health sector today because it's not a person who lies over there. It's a liver or a kidney or a bone or a brain or something. We need to bring them in. They are not dangerous. I know it's, you don't understand or you don't believe me, and I, I don't think you're going to do it, but remember I said it because you have to. And if we do all this, then we will have this massive change of culture and that will affect all of us. We're going to look upon the work we do in a different way from now. Either we like it or not. If we don't like it, then the young people like Anders, the 18 years kid here. If we don't fix his diabetes or treatment or develop on that, he will not sit and wait. He will try to do it something else by himself. And then they will move on. Then this is going to happen. And that is for me, I am I3. Thank you very much for today, and I look forward to meeting you again in the next When the Silos Are Done. Thank you very much, Anders, for those thoughts for your journey home. We hope that you have enjoyed the day um, and that you have met some new friends had some interesting discussions, have some new thoughts to carry with you for the work that you do. We hope that you will get in touch with us. Uh, use the app. You can use our website. The session on big data that attracted a lot of attention here has some more facilities on the app where you can also send the more comments and details and also um, some feedback on that session. Uh, you would also receive a survey. Uh, of what you thought of the event in general and any type of feedback or questions you have, please feel free to come to us, send us emails, um, come up and to dis discuss with us and we are trying to help you as much as we can. So thank you very much. We hope to see you again next year. We hope you have enjoyed the day and have a safe trip back home. Thank you.